Hello, my friends. We are live. It's the Bradley J Show. And on Friday, as usual, on a Friday, we have Rich Rubino, who is a political historian and sometimes commentator. But today, we're going, we have kind of a fun topic. Mm -hmm. It's about words and phrases that are political in origin, stuff that you hear probably lots of times during the course of a year. And you never stop to think, where did that come from? Well, surprisingly, a lot of them came from the world of politics, particularly, I guess, there with it. 1840 race that uh, was packed full of them. But our uh, political historian, Rich, is going to go through, what is it, the top 10, top 20? How many do you have? Uh, I can think of a litany of them. All right. We'll call it We'll call it 10, uh, but then we'll probably go over 10. I know we'll people like 10, it. absolutely. Okay, we'll call it 20, top 20. Yes. Look, uh, phrases and words that are familiar but come from uh, the, the politics. And I'll let you uh, begin. Yes, absolutely. We just talked about the 1840 presidential campaign, scintillating campaign, basically the first presidential campaign where a candidate was actually packaged. And interestingly, in that race, there was, you hear this all the time, you hear this, you hear this person can't win, this person can't win. You hear this all the time with third parties. This is where the whole thing really began. So Martin Van Buren was the Democrat, very unpopular. There was the Panic of 1837, a Great Depression under his administration, and he basically did almost nothing about it. He was very conservative. The Democratic Party at the time was the conservative party in the country, and he literally sold the White House tools so that they could not be used for government projects. So as a result, he was relatively unpopular, and in order to win, what his handlers tried to do is they tried to get the Whig Party to nominate the weakest possible candidate. And Henry Clay was who they were mostly trepidatious, who they're mostly afraid, if you will, of. So they started this slogan because Henry Clay had, sought, had, 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 had lost the presidency before. They said, well, Henry Clay can't win. So they would start this rumor around so that, Whig, so that members of the Whig Party would say, well, I may like him better, but let's vote for William Henry Harrison instead. So accordingly, William Henry Harrison actually garners the nomination. Uh, Henry Clay later says in his life, I'd rather be right than to be president. Well, he ran for president three times, and he he was actually the nominee of his party three times, and he actually lost three times. So William Henry Harrison, who they thought they could actually beat, lands up garnering the nomination. And William and Martin Van Buren and his acolytes in the press start this um, start, tried making fun of him. They said, "Well, William Henry Harrison, because William Henry Harrison was known for someone who really liked to just kind of sit around and read Greek philosophy." They said, "Give him about two thousand dollars, a jug of whiskey, and." Um, and have him um, and have and have and, and and he'll never run for, and have him sit in a log cabin and he'll never be president. We don't have to worry about it. So William J. So I'm sorry. So uh, so the campaign of William Henry Harrison started basically. They brilliantly used this to his advantage. Now w M William Henry Harrison actually came from a very patrician family, whereas Martin Van Buren actually was a son of an innkeeper. So Martin Van Buren. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, William Henry Harrison had briefly lived in a log cabin after a stint in the military. So they tried to play that up. And they actually made these log cab they made these miniature log cabins that they would use as campaign propaganda, if you will. William Harrison came from, as I say, he I mean his, you know, his father literally signed the Declaration of Independence. He was a very wealthy person. But then they made these actual jugs and they put whiskey in it. And it was a guy named E. G. Booze who invented, who came up with this with this ideation. And this is where the term booze came from. So they'd put this in here and they would say, well, William Henry Harrison, William Henry Harrison, he's essentially the populist candidate. He would dress down in public. We see this all the time today. You know, politics is probably the only profession I can think of where an elite education and an, an elite political experience are actually a liability and not an asset, not an attribute in American politics. So, so let me see. If, let me make sure I understand it. Uh, yeah. In order to, well, pretend that they, they, they were going to get the candidate to go off in the cabin and with some booze and, and read Greek philosophy, they came up with this uh, merchandise that was a jug that, that uh, what did it say on the jug? It just said the name E.G. Booze for the, okay. name, for, for, the guy who, right. who, for the guy who came up with this idea. And that's where booze comes from. Yes. By the way, you mentioned the Whig Party, W-H-I-G. What a... What is that an acronym for something? Where does that word come from? No, it actually comes from the anti-monarch party in Britain, in Great Britain. It's basically comes from that. And it was basically, 
a political. So if the, the the first two parties were the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, then after that, essentially, is the, essentially the Democratic Republican Party kind of dissipated. There was a party called the Whig Party. There are actually four presidents who were Whigs. Uh, William Henry Harrison was the first. Then John Tyler, who succeeded him, was also a Whig, although the Whig Party basically expelled him from the party because he didn't like much of their legislation. Then in 1848, uh, Zachary Taylor, old rough and ready, and becomes pre becomes president. He was a Whig. He dies. Millard Fillmore succeeds him. And those are the only four presidents who were actual Whigs. So the word Whig, W-H-I-G, actually comes from Great Britain. Is it the hair replacement article? <laughs> yes, it comes from the hair club for men. <laughs> no, um, it's it's from it's, the head it's, thing because because they were in favor of the, some of the presidents that wore wigs. No, it was nothing to do. It was just it was an anti-monarch term. So comes, what's the what's the the word come from? Any idea? W h i g. That was something that you'd have to look up. Okay. So, so number two, we got oh, a new. Oh yes, in that campaign as well. There was another so William so um, William Henry Harrison's opponent, of course, was Martin Van Buren, and Martin Van Buren was from Kinderhook, New York, and he would often sign legislation okay, because he was from Kinderhook. So accordingly, they I formed these okay clubs, and eventually the word started in American parlance okay. People started saying okay, okay, okay. So and what what's that from? How does that relate to Kinderhook? He was from Kinderhook, New York, and that, and how does that? How does he would okay sign come his, from? He would sign. He so when he not so much legislation, but when he would sign a would, he would sign a document, he would sign it, okay, because he was his nickname was Old Kinderhook. Okay, he, okay, his, his nickname was Old Kinderhook. I get it now. And he would abbreviate it. Okay. And here's something interesting. So Andrew Jackson, who was the predecessor of Martin Van Buren, and he was this was the Democratic Party at the time. Um, his opponents of Andrew Jackson was Andrew Jackson was known essentially as somebody they thought he was a plebeian, he was a heathen, everything else, and he couldn't spell. They said, well, Andrew Jackson came up with a word because he was trying to say all correct, and he thought that all correct was okay. But that's completely apocryphal, completely mendacious. It was because of Martin Van Buren, and it inadvertently got into the American lexicon. Martin Van Buren was from Kinderhook. Where is it? Kinderhook, New York. New York. New York. I want to remember that to impress my brother. Okay. Yes, absolutely. But if he watches this, then I'll, I'll be caught in my own trap. <laughs> okay, so let's go to number three. Yes, in that same political campaign, this was the genius of we of William May Harrison's campaign. They know that in order to get people to come to a rally, the candidates, by the way, did not rally back then at the time. They sent out surrogates to do it. It was seen as unseemly to do it. But William Henry Harrison's campaign knew that to bring people to a rally, they had to actually have something already at the rally. So they had these big balls that they would roll around, and the rolls, ba balls basically excoriated the policies of Martin Van Buren and talked about how great William Henry Harrison was. So they'd roll them. Sometimes they'd actually roll them from town to town. And that's where the slogan, keep the ball rolling, came from. Uh, good one. And in that, this was with the one, a great slogan that the Whig, Whig Party came up with for their ticket. So the ticket, of course, was William Henry Harrison and John Tyler was the vice presidential nominee. So William Henry Harrison was the was a hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe, basically against the Shawnee Indians, um, and they called him Tippecanoe. The, that that became his nickname, Tippecanoe. So they would say Tippecanoe and Tyler too, Tippecanoe and Tyler too. And they made a song where it was "Keep the ball rolling, keep the ball rolling for Tippecanoe and Tyler too." And then they would be eventually abbreviated all itself all the way down to Tip and Tie. Okay, backing up so I can remember it. Tippecanoe was, uh, there was a battle. There was a battle. Native American battle there, and he was involved in it? He was, and he was the, he was the victor. And what? And which person was this? William Henry Harrison. Okay, got to remember that. And here's something you got to remember, too. Did you know that just yesterday was the 250th birthday for William Henry Harrison? I, you know, I missed it. I feel bad. I didn't send any anything to the, anything to, fam, to the family or anything <laughs> no. he was fascinating figure he was 68 years old did everything to actually get the presidency a brilliant campaign then he delivers an inauguration address and this basically shows what people had kind of excoriated him for giving you know giving these long harangues these long speeches he gives the longest inaugural address in american history he speaks and speaks and speaks he talks about philosophy he talks about just about everything else the origins of government 
gets a cold. 31 di days later, he dies from pneumonia. Now, there are a lot of questions about whether it was because of his speech in the inauguration, but it was outside and he did not wear a jacket. Some people believe it might have been something else, but essentially he dies 31 days into office. So essentially the campaign is what really defined William Henry Harrison, not William Henry Harrison himself, although his legacy lived on in his grandson. His grandson was the inimitable Benjamin Harrison, who became president in 1889. And um, the and the people who were his opponents made fun of Benjamin Harrison. They they had a big picture because Benjamin Harrison was extremely small, and they had a big picture of him with a hat, and the hat was too big for him. And they basically said that Benjamin Harrison was trying to uh, kind of live through his father, grandfather, but his grand but his hat of the grandfather was essentially too big for him. So that was part of the legacy of William Henry Harrison was Benjamin Harrison. So William Heller, Henry Harrison literally talked himself to death. Uh, that is. Probably we can't say that with irrefutable proof, but probably that's what happened. It was he, it's more it's there's a lot of causation now. Correlation without causation can be different, but essentially the theory is that he gave this long speech without a jacket outside in the cold, and that probably gave him the pneumonia, and he probably died a month into his presidency. He was 68 years old, the oldest president up to the, at that time. Hmm. Uh, yeah, back then people didn't really live as long, right? Except with it. With exceptions, of course, like Benjamin Franklin. and Oh, yes, absolutely. There were always exceptions, but um, 68 years. Imagine you're 68 years old and you get elected president um, at that time. And imagine what people were kind of thinking in the 1840s that somebody that old was actually president. That was one of the things that they certainly used against him. But it's a brilliant campaign, how William Henry Harrison garnered the nomination and then how William Harrison, how William Henry Harrison actually won the presidency. But then again... Part of it was, I think you could argue that perhaps anybody, Martin Van Buren, was going to win that year because the American people wanted government action. They wanted a more, um, they, they wanted a more active president. And Martin Van Buren was very much a kind of almost libertarian ideologue who believed in the gospel of small government. And that was just not what the people wanted at that time. All right. Excellent. Is that, let's see the three or four. I'm kind of losing count, but uh, let's get another one. Here's something you hear all the time, and you hear this term ad nauseum, the term rhino. You hear yeah. it on the Democratic side, too. Do you know what rhino stands for? Yes, uh, Republican in name only. Yes. So the question is, first of all, where did this term come from? What are the origins? Before rhino, there was actually another term. It was called gypsy moth. So a gypsy moth was basically the species that was invasive in urban areas, and conservatives used it to belittle, disparage, excoriate liberal Republicans. Now, the party was basically, liberal Republicans, believe it or not, were once just about hegemonic in the party. Alf Landon was the party's nominee in 1936. 1940, it was Wendell Wilkie, Thomas E. Dewey, 44, 48, Eisenhower, Nixon, all considered basically moderate or liberal Republicans, but there was a very, very liberal wing of the Republican Party. And that wing of the party essentially was excoriated by the conservatives. In 1964, Barry Goldwater won the nomination and basically took it, the nomination from the liberals. Nelson Rockefeller, the governor of New York, was his opponent. It came down to California, and in part because Nelson Rockefeller had been, had been divorced, that became a huge issue against him. And Barry Goldwater won, and Barry Goldwater was very much an unadulterated conservative, wins the nomination, there's a big, gives a speech at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. Nelson Rockefeller gave a speech as well, basically disavowing extremism. And he was basically heckled. He was booed. You know, you think Marjorie Taylor Greene booing um, Joe Biden was something. This was a real heckle. And um, then Donald, then, I'm um, sorry, Donald Trump, Barry Goldwater gets up there and people think, well, Barry Goldwater is going to moderate his message. Instead, he gets up there and he says, let me remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. Now he kind of took that, yes, 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 yes. What was going on at the time? What was the context that allowed the super conservative Barry Goldwater to excel? Yep. What there was, was the, the, what it was, was the, kind of, yep. Basically there was a movement within the conservative party that said that we've nominated these liberals and we want to nominate somebody that's one of us. So they said we've nominated, a lot of these people were very, were very infuriated, if you will, with the Eisenhower administration in part because they thought that the Eisenhower administration, as Barry Goldwater himself would call it, a dime store New Deal. 
meaning in other words that Eisenhower had worked essentially had basically moderated the New Deal, which is FDR's um, social programs, more government, Harry S. Truman's Fair Deal, which is essentially a continuation of the New Deal, was adding with some with some addendums to it. They thought that we essentially we need a true conservative as our party's nominee. So Nelson Rockefeller is the early front runner. He runs for the nomination. Actually, interestingly, that year, and this was the beginning of Vietnam, basically the Civil Rights Revolution. Interestingly, that year, though, neither of them won the New Hampshire primary. It was actually Henry Cabot Lodge. If you remember, Henry Cabot Lodge was a senator from Massachusetts, relatively liberal Republican, who lost to JFK in Massachusetts in 1952, in part because he was spending the predominance of his time campaigning around the country for I, the, the, his for his 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 candidate for the uh, presidency, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and basically neglecting his duties back home. Kennedy kind of comes in, purloins the election, steals it from him. So in 1964. Um, in the 19th, by the way, when John F. Kennedy, in a bipartisan effort, after Henry Cabot Lodge ran for the vice presidential nomination with Richard Nixon in 1960, Kennedy nominates, the Senate confirms Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. as the ambassador to South Vietnam. So he's nowhere near the country. He's not, ever, he's not an announced candidate, but there's a draft Henry Cabot Lodge movement. His name's not even on the ballot, but there's a write-in candidacy. And Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. actually wins the nomination in New Hampshire. Didn't go much further after that, but he garners the nomination. He garners the um, wins the nomination. He won the delegates in New Hampshire. So then eventually you get down to Goldwater, who's a conservative, and Rockefeller, who is the liberal. Rockefeller has some personal problems. Many Republicans says they can't vote for somebody who's divorced. They say he abandoned his family. California's California's winner take all, and Goldwater wins the nomination. Now at the convention, there's a latch ditch. There's a latch ditch effort. William Scranton, the governor of uh, Pennsylvania, basically runs as the as the heir to Rockefeller. He loses as well. Rockefeller wins the nomination. I mean, I'm sorry, Goldwater wins the nomination. Then Goldwater tries to take back a little bit of what he had said. He actually goes to a Republican conference and says, "Yes, we need party unity." And he says, "Some of what they're saying about me is essentially not true." He said, "Essentially, I do support Social Security, for example." He says, I do support the United States being in the United Nations. He actually run, runs all these political ads where he comes in and he talks about, um, he basically tries talks about a moderate message. And one, he actually has Dwight Eisenhower, who's kind of the forebearer, who's really kind of the tribune of the moderate and liberal wing, basically coming on with sitting there with Barry Goldwater at his farm up in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and basically praising him, lauding praise and saying that I support Barry Goldwater. Now, personally, he would say that Barry Goldwater was basically dumb because he had called him policies a dime store new deal. But at least for the cameras, they pretended to get along. Goldwater wins the nomination. Um, Goldwater goes around goes around the country, you know, campaigning. And one of his biggest criticisms about his opponent, the Democrat Lyndon B. Johnson, he said, everywhere I go, Lyndon comes here and then he dedicates a damn because Johnson was essentially going around the country. And he would say, well, I just gave it the, this, I just signed an appropriation for this, an appropriation for this, an appropriation for this. And eventually Johnson, of course, um, wins the presidency. He actually wins 44 states. The only states Goldwater won that year were deep self states and his home state of Arizona. And interestingly about the whole civil rights issue, the reports, because this is a question you hear a lot. You say, wasn't the Republican Party the party of civil rights? Well, they were the part, they certainly were. Certainly, if you go back to Lincoln, then Grant and Harrison, William ha Warren G. Harding, who was president from 1921 to 1923, a Republican actually went to the South and excoriated segregation. So there is, it, there is a lot, there is a verisimilitude of truth there in terms of the Republican Party being the party of civil rights. In 1964, uh, Barry Goldwater, for constitutional reasons, not for um, so not for not because he was prejudiced, he was actually a member of the NAACP back in Arizona, voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Civil Rights Act was actually passed. The Democrats, the Northern Democrats, supported it, and many Northern and Midwestern Republicans supported it. In the South, actually, in the North, pretty much every every non-Southern Democrat, except for Bob Byrd from from the state of West Virginia voted for the Civil Rights Act. Every solitary Southern Democrat, with the exception of the liberal Ralph Yalbro from Johnson's home state of Texas, voted against the Civil Rights Act. So it was very much regional. And Goldwater was one of those Western kind of libertarian Republicans who believed it was, uncon it was not constitutionally permissible. So he said at the time, though, electorally, you go where the ducks are. 
So essentially, instead of going for Republicans who had always had who had garnered 30, 40 percent of the African-American vote. Now, essentially, you also try to go for white Southerners and Southerners were really um, white Southerners were always in the domain of the Democratic Party. So that year he wins Mississippi with 87 percent of the vote. He wins Georgia. I'm sorry. He wins um, Alabama, for example. All these southern states basically flip from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, um, in part because of Barry Goldwater is winning the nomination. Whereas on the other side of things, Republic, traditional Republican states like Utah, Idaho, North Dakota, and South Dakota, which have not gone for a Democrat, have not gone for any Democratic nominee since, all went for Lyndon Johnson that year. Lyndon uh-huh. Johnson won Alaska. The only time any Democrat has won the state of Alaska. No Democrat since then has won the state of Alaska or before then has won the state of Alaska. So absolutely fascinating. And um, of course, after that election, the Republican Party has kind of a catharsis. They say, we need to nominate someone who can actually win. Enter Richard M. Nixon. Nixon, who ran for vice pre- for president in 1960, lost, although some people think it was Mayor Daley in Chicago that stole the election for him. Um, in 1962, ran for governor of California, lost to Pat Brown. Pat Brown was running for a, a third term. 1966, he goes all over the country and campaigns for every Republican that would have him. Pat Buchanan's with him. Um, he actually wanted to sit in the aisle. He never wanted to sit in the aisle seat or the middle seat. He always wanted to sit in the window seat so people would not come up to him and try to get pictures with him or, or um, now we'd call him selfies, but essentially get his autograph. He really didn't like people that much. So... He'd go all around the country, campaign for this, about every Republican, conservatives. He campaigned for Nelson Rockefeller, liberals. He campaigned for John Hall, Hammersmith, conservatives. He'd go all over the country, and he would try to present himself as kind of a moderate between the Rockefeller bloodline and the conservative bloodline. So accordingly, 1968 occurs. Nelson Rockefeller's running, even though he said he would not run. He does run for president as a liberal. Ronald Reagan declares at the convention that he's a candidate. And Richard Nixon runs basically as straight down the middle and between both those two wings. And he's because he because he was always seen as a liberal during the Eisenhower administration, or at least a moderate. Some of the Rockefeller people said, yeah, he's palatable. The other side, many of the Reagan people who may not have liked him in the past said, well, he campaigned for Goldwater, gave the nominating speech for Goldwater in 1964 when other Republicans would not do would not support him. And you know what? He campaigned all around the country for Republicans. So he's palatable to us. And that's how Richard Nixon wins the nomination. So uh, back to Whig, W-H-I-G. We were, we were wondering about the origin of the actual Nixon. word. And Joe says that it's related to Wigamore. So, okay, I looked up Wigamore, and I guess he did too. Either It looks like he looked it up. What I get is basically it's an insurgent uh, from Scotland, uh, 7th century, 17th century Scottish insurgents, says one definition. Now there's from Scott Whig, W-H-I-G, to drive, applied to raiding parties in Scotland about 1648. So maybe they thought of themselves as an insurgent party or a rebel party or something like that. And yeah, it's very it's very confusing if you look at, if you look at some of the definitions, um, but it's certainly the certainly coming from coming from Scotland is basically I think the consensus, but also uh, the, the being anti-monarch in um, in Great Britain is also part of it. And Joe's uh, just to give give his uh, work a little uh, oxygen. It says refers to cattle drivers from Western Scotland. They used to then used by the English to refer to a radical group of Scots. Became political turn in 1678 regarding KC2. I don't know who that King somebody. Two, brother could take the throne. All right, well, you know, we looked into it a little bit, but uh, we'll, our scope is limited here on that. Let's go to the next phrase. Okay, so that was Gypsy Moth. Then comes the term rhino. It was the first ter- time we can think of it, We can, people as actually in print, rather, was 1992 after Bill Clinton wins the presidency. And a reporter of New Hampshire, John Sasso, and the Union leader, New Hampshire, Un- Manchester Union leader, rather, basically says that they're part that they are that they are Republicans in name only who would support Bill Clinton on certain things. Basically, they are Republicans who are somewhat recreant to conservative ideology. That's basically what it is. Um, and it's be- but it's become it's it's become a pejorative for basically any Republican that is not kind of monochrome in terms of thinking the way 
the conservative, the way that contemporary conservatives think, which is interesting because, as I always say in this program, Donald Trump changed the trajectory ideologically of Republicans in terms of their views on trade, in terms of their views on immigration, and in terms of their views on foreign intervention. His views are different than every Republican from Eisenhower through Mitt Romney in 2012 beginning in 1952. So the really question of how you define a rhino is fascinating. And if you look at the history of the Republican Party, the Republican Party was not found and founded as a little as a as a small government party. Quite the contrary. It was essentially founded as an part part of it was because it wanted to it was opposed to the slave to the to the it supported the abolition of slavery. Some did the abolitionists and another wing wanted to essentially wanted essentially for it not not to have slavery in the western territories but basically they also wanted they also wanted a larger federal government in terms of dealing with education for example more mean efficient social services pretty much the opposite of the democratic party which was basically a party of free trade and less government so how you actually define a rhino you know it's obviously there are many definitions it's interesting how the how the parties involved uh, evolve you had uh, reagan fighting the fighting the russians soviets yeah. and russians and now Republicans side with the Russians. They actually take the Russian side, and they're actually using Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, for their own purposes now. And by the way, if I could just, since I, I spoke about her, I'm sure you watched the State of the Union address. Oh, yes. And it, it seemed like President Biden was goading the uh, Freedom Crew into uh, saying something that would give him an opening to spin, to spring a trap. And he was ready for them with uh, a retort. Yes. And some material. Can you just briefly recap that for everybody? Yes. Um, and I think this was, this was essentially a strategy. Basically what he did, so just for some history, Rick Scott's a senator from Florida, and he was the chairman of the Republican Senatorial C Campaign Committee last time around. And he issued essentially he, he essentially issued a blueprint for the Republican Party. And part of what he said is that all federal government programs should be sunsetted, meaning essentially they should be re they should be re they should you need to essentially look at every government program after five years. And essentially Joe Biden interprets that to mean, well, that must include Medicare and Social Security. If you look at polls, Medicare and Social Security are extremely popular to the extent of 80% of the American people say do not truncate either of them. They're very popular government programs. Joe Biden knows this. Joe Biden knows that there's actually text of Rick Scott saying this. So he says in his speech, he talks about how he's going to protect Social Security and Medicare. And he says, I know it's not all of you. So that's a way to him prever prevaricate in many respects. But it's some of you. He's referring directly to Rick Scott and directly to Rick Scott's essentially assertions. And he says that they're, they're essentially written down. And when he says that, some members of Congress heckle him. One of, say, them is Mar one of them is Marjorie Taylor Greene. They holler out, liar, liar. Well, yeah. And um, when Marjorie Taylor Greene does, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Joe Biden essentially wants, in 2024, every Democrat running for Congress to run against Marjorie Taylor Greene. They want that image right there. They want an image of someone like Dan Bacon, the most liberal, probably the most liberal member of the Republican Party in a district in Nebraska, which represents right around Omaha and Lincoln that went for Joe Biden last time around, but has a Republican congressman. They want a picture of him right here sitting there. And then they want a screenshot of Marjorie Taylor Greene basically saying that he is Mar that he that he essentially is a clone of Marjorie Taylor Greene. They want every Republican to be a clone of Marjorie Taylor Greene. You're going to see a picture of my prediction here of Marjorie Taylor Greene yelling liar. And then you show a picture of the Republican and then they say something about what Rick Scott said and the Republican Party wants to cut Social Security and cut Medicare. And then again, show a picture of Marjorie Taylor Greene. It was brilliant. That's what they got. They got that image. Joe Biden, <laughs> if he runs for in 2024, he might even show whoever his Republican nominee is, he would even show a picture of that person with a screenshot. And then Marjorie Taylor Greene, so that when people think of the Republican Party, the first person that comes to their mind is Marjorie Taylor Greene. Well, both sides do that. Uh, oh, yeah. The Republicans want everyone to be running against Omar. They paint her as the, the every Republican to be her. And they all want every Republican to, when they go into the booth, to think that 
every Democrat to be her and that all Democrats are her. So they do the same thing. They pick the worst one and make that the poster child for the enemy. Well, this was brilliant. The Dem- and it's called the, basically a straw man argument. And brilliant the way Democrats did this in Newt Gingrich in 1994. Basically, Newt Gingrich gets elected, gets become speaker. And one of the first thing he says is essentially he argues that you need to cut the, he says at the time, the growth of the school lunch program, which is very popular in the country. And then they're, and then they're going to Yitzhak Rabin's funeral. And um, Bill Clinton's there. Newt Gingrich is there. Bob Dole's there. Newt Gingrich later complains that essentially he was in the back of the air. He was in the back of Air Force One and didn't get to talk to Clinton enough. And then there was this big picture of him looking like a baby. Newt Gingrich. Clinton used that. Newt Gingrich becomes extremely unpopular. So consequently, the 1996 elections, Bill Clinton tried to run against Newt Gingrich. He essentially ran against, when he talked about Bob Dole, he'd always say the Dole-Gingrich plan. And you'd see pictures in all the political ads. It would be Bob Dole, dark, and a picture of Newt Gingrich and saying they want to cut Social Security and Medicare, essentially. Jim McGovern, who ran, congressman from the Worcester area, his one of, he was running against a guy named Peter Blue. And Peter Blute was a relatively moderate to liberal Republican. And his slogan that year was, you wouldn't vote for Newt. Why would you ever vote for Blue? So everywhere, the fact that you have the name Newt Gingrich, the fact it's kind of an odd name, people know who Newt Gingrich is. And everyone wants to run against Newt Gingrich. In fact, Michael Cole, the cookie magnet who ran, actually did run against Newt Gingrich in the 6th District of Georgia, right around Marietta and Columbus. He would say, I'm the actual person who is running against Newt Gingrich. Uh, Bill Weld was running against Senator John Kerry that year. And Bill Weld, when Newt Gingrich got elected, said called Newt Gingrich his, his, his ideological soulmate. John Kerry used that against him everywhere. And at wow. one point, Bill Weld in one of the debates says, you know, you should if you really want to run against Newt Gingrich, you should go down to Georgia and run against him in a seat. because." But it was working absolutely everywhere. And every Republican was all of a sudden alligated to Newt Gingrich. So it's worked. So both you're right, both sides absolutely do it, but it's a very it's a very popular political strategy. Find somebody that you, that you think would be unappealing na- unappealing nationally or if somebody is a moderate, a moderate democrat or a moderate republican, find the most the most liberal democrat or the most liberal republican and essentially say that this person is just essentially a clone of that person. So if you're running in northern Maine in Arista County, Maine, which is relatively conservative and you're a democrat, all of a sudden, you see all these political ads that show that you're the most liberal member in the history of, of the country, and you're essentially the reincarnation of Leninists and Stalin and Stalinism. So it works everywhere, and you're certainly going to see Marjorie Taylor Greene. In reality, she's only a sophomore congressman, congresswoman right now who has very little power, and most of the legislation that she proposes are called one-house bills, meaning essentially she'll propose legislation. She'll get a few co-sponsors that are members of the Freedom Caucus, the conservative members of the Republican Party. No one in the Senate will co-sponsor it. Doesn't I mean it doesn't even go to the Senate. Doesn't these legislation she proposes doesn't get out of committee. So she's basically uh, has very little actual power. But for but rhetorically and in terms mm-hmm. of optics, that's what the Democrats want. So the smart thing in this case was the fact that they sprung that trap at such a high profile moment with so many cameras on it. Everyone was watching, and her and, and, and knew she was kind of ready for. It. Oh, back, back to Peter Blute. Wasn't there some other issue with Peter Blute? That was later in life. That was <laughs> he became mass board director, and he when he was mass board director, he was on a um, he was on a booze cruise, and there was somebody, um, there was a scantily clad uh, lady on there who essentially gave um, went like this to um, to the reporters from the Herald. The next day, it was in the co- cover of the Herald, and eventually, though he kind of he did recover and he became a relatively successful uh, radio talk show host in 1992. He was elected because Joe Early, the congressman, was um, there were a couple of kind of scandals that were permeating him. And that year also, uh, Peter Torkelson was elected as a Republican who defeated Nick and Mavra Rulis, who was also had some scandals t- permeating him. They were both elected as Republicans in de- relatively Democratic districts, both reelected in 94, the Gingrich year with no Republican governor, U.S. senator or U.S. member of the House of Representatives incumbent lost. Then 1996, we're back to homeostasis, and both of them lost. And there hasn't been a Republican member of the House of Representatives from Massachusetts since that, that 1996 election when both Torkelson and Blute lost. And they both basically lost in part by being portrayed as Newt Gingrich acolytes. Okay, a new saying. What's you that? Another, you have another saying? Oh, yeah. Oh, I got, oh, I got plenty of them. 
Um, so those so, so those are ones that I find very those are ones that I find very interesting. It goes from Gypsy Moth, and then it essentially um, comes to um, it come it comes to the word, term Rhino, and of course you hear the word Rhino just about ad nauseum all over the country. Here's one though, Missile Gap. When John F. Kennedy's running for re-election, Senator 1958, he talks about a missile gap. He's trying to say that the Eisenhower administration is basically hasn't had their eye on the ball. As a result, the Soviet Union has more missiles than the United States. He repeats this again in 1960, running for president against Republican Richard Nixon. He repeats it, and the Nixon administration, because of intelligence, basically can't. Nixon, the Eisenhower administration, basically doesn't really refute it. Kennedy gets elected, and then he looks at the military budget, and Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, says, "Well, you know about this missile gap? It's not true." And Kennedy said, "Oh yeah." Well, he said there were a lot, and they kind of blinked at him and said, "There were a lot of patriotic Americans like myself who are very misguided by that." So essentially, <laughs> he made up a missile gap. And he continued to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And eventually, if you keep repeating things, people will start to believe it. But the reality of the situation is it simply was not true. And is that phrase used now to say <clears throat> other situations or like that situation? It's very, very rarely, <clears throat> but it, it's, for people in the know, they will use it on occasion. All right. Let's have another one. Here's one. The term mending fences. Yeah. John Sherman, who was a senator from Ohio, went back to his home in Ohio to his farm. And he said, I'm back to essentially mend fences. Now, he probably literally meant he was he was going to look over at farm and really kind of fix his fence. But people basically in some can some newspaper reports interpreted that to mean that he was going home, um, that he was go that he was going home to consolidate support in his home state because he'd be away. From his, you know, he'd spend time away and spend time in Washington. And then by 1880, he actually ran for president. And this term mending fences, that's where that came from. And in 2000, Al Gore running for president after he declared after he essentially um declared that he had lost after the supreme court five to four had ruled against him in that protracted 2000 you know that 36 day election in his speech to the american people he said i don't know what's next for me quite yet but i suspect i'll spend some time in tennessee mending some fences so he met by that the fact that he had lost his home state had he won it by three points had he won his home state we never have had to worry about hanging Chad in New Hampshire or in Florida. But the fact of the matter is people started to see in his home state, started to seeing him as almost cult, almost alien. He didn't spend as much time there as I think he wanted to. Issues like tobacco regulation and guns, his support for gun control had basically changed um, from when he what where he was when he was a senator. So consequently, in 1990, he gets reelected with 67 percent of the vote. By 2000, he can't even win his home state. So he uses that term mending fences. And he really got that from Sherman. I see. And that basically means I'm going to fix broken relationships. That's what. Yeah. I, yeah. I, basically I in my usually in my home state. All right. You're going back. And then there was another Sherman who um, who was, there was talk about him, the Sherman who went from the Civil War. And in 1884, people wanted him to run for president. He made a Sherman S statement basically saying, I will not be a candidate for president. That's the candidate. That's where the slogan, a Sherman S statement comes from. So what does that mean now, a Sherman S statement? Basically, so this is this is part of the game in American politics, and you hear it all the time. You ask somebody that's not you ask somebody, will you run for president? Usually you sell this with, for example, Elizabeth Warren in 2018 when she was running for re-election. When you're running for re actually running for an office, you don't want to say, Well, I'm gonna run for president two years down the road, four years down the road. So you prepare get you hedge. So essentially she would say, I'm not running for president. I see. Which is technically true. Um, now, sometimes a candidate will get in a position where they have to declare they're that they will not run for president. Yeah. Bill somebody Clinton. Gets in in, somebody Bill, gets him in a bind. Yeah. Bill Clinton in 1990 was running against a businessman named Sheffield Nelson, and a poll showed 44 percent Nelson, 44 percent Clinton. Everyone in Arkansas thought that Bill Clinton was going to run for president. Well, not everyone, but most people in the know in 1992. So people are questioning, should he even be running for re-election in the first place? And Sheffield Nelson's basically making this, basically saying, we're going to elect you. And as soon as we elect you, you're going to be spending your time running for president. So during that one debate they have, a reporter asked Bill Clinton, do you agree to serve out your full term? He says, you bet. His aides are, his aides are befuddled that he actually made a Sherman-esque statement like that. So that means essentially, he says, you bet. That is declarative. That's a declarative statement that I'm going to serve out my full term. Right. So he gets reelected. 
And then he goes through it just like Ron DeSantis is doing now and George W. Bush did in 1999, respectively. He goes through an entire legislative session and people start to think, well, maybe he's not going to run for president. Then he sees polls. Polls show George H.W. Bush's job approval rating in the high 30s, thinks it's a way for him to win. So he goes on a listening tour of the state of Arkansas, basically goes all around the state unannounced and goes to goes to churches, goes to restaurants, goes to um, goes to diners and asks people, what do you think of the pledge I made? And he says that basically the people said that I can do more for the state as president than I can as governor. Saying so that's how he declares he's going to run for president. So he blames it on the people. Well, he says that basically that he's what he said was the circumstances are different. Right. We're in an economic downturn right now, and I'm the only person who's essentially has a certain platform. And he mm-hmm. says I have to get in this race. And he says essentially my constituents support that. And when he ran for president in, two, in 1992. Arkansas is the only state in the country where he won an outright majority. So there was something to that, that people just generally don't care if you prevaricate or if you make a declarative statement. Pete Wilson, 1994, is running for re-election against Kathleen Brown, the state treasurer. He says unequivocally that he will serve out his full term. Next year, he decides he's going to run for president and does the same thing and basically says, I can do more for my state as president than I can do as governor. But both Pete Wilson and Bill Clinton had to make this declarative statement that they would not run for president. Nelson Rockefeller did the same thing in 1968. Barack Obama, interestingly, the day after he was elected to the United States Senate in 1994, no, 2004 rather, beating Alan Keyes, this is after he had already won re-election, he already won elections, so he can basically say, I'm gonna run for president, whatever, but they asked him, will you serve? And he says, no, let me say unequivocally that I will not run for president. My only, and my only responsibility, my only concern is to be the best possible senator from Illinois then a couple of years later, Harry Reid and Chuck Schumer come to him and said, we need some, we need more people in this race. Barack Obama looks at polls and shows he can win, and he essentially goes against that pledge. But as you make a Sherman statement, essentially you're saying, okay. under no circumstances will I run for president. I love it. Uh, in, in a related question, will DeSantis run against Donald Trump? My supposition is yes. I think he's doing, he has to, he's doing essentially right now, he's in a legislative, he's got a legislative session so it's kind of, this is something I'll talk about, the Rose Garden strategy, which is mm-hmm. essentially by governing, you gain popularity. Because as opposed to going out and campaigning, he could be spending his time in Iowa, but instead is he's spending his time essentially working in the role as governor and people are seeing you as an executive. And doing a good, you know, a job they like. Yes, yeah, so this is perfected by Gerald Ford in 1976. Mm-hmm. Gerald Ford sometimes would not go out campaigning because he'd be doing, he'd steady make announcements terms of governing he'd actually make the announcements in the rose garden and jimmy carter complained about that you know ford's never out there campaigning he just hangs out in the rose garden and it actually worked for gerald ford and interestingly he would actually when he ran for when he ran for a full term in 76 for the republican primary sometimes he would actually go to places and he would announce you know i just brought you 300 million dollars for 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 a light rail or whatever it was and at one point his opponent former governor of california ronald reagan says you know, every time Gerald Ford comes here, I don't know if we should be playing um, Hail to the Chief or Here Comes Santa Claus. Aha. Uh-huh. So there, the upside is he's seen governing, and another upside is he avoids increased ta- attacks by Trump, and he avoids a certain amount of scrutiny by not declaring. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, there's the fundraising. Yeah, Is he, do you think, secretly selling or has his, having his people say, yeah, he's definitely running. Keep your money dry. Don't give it to Trump. We're going to run. We just can't no. tell you now. Is he I doing think that? Basically, that's what they're saying. They're saying we have a legislative session right now. He has to be a full-time governor. When this is over, essentially, they're going to say that he's going to run. It's called the great mentioning, by the way. People mention your name hmm. and they keep mentioning your name. And he's get, look at, Think about the free press he's getting right now. Yeah. And the fact that Donald Trump is going after him and attacking him I think that actually raises his credibility because he's attacking Ron DeSantis, whereas he could have been he could be attacking Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, Asa Hutchinson, or anyone else in the race. But the fact that he's going after Ron DeSantis shows that that's the candidate he's most trepidatious about. Hmm. At least now, it might be that he thinks I can essentially. It could be a part of his strategy by going after him is he could think I could get Ron DeSantis to the point that he says I don't want any more of this. I'm not going to run, and then he gets him out of the race that way. And then Trump says, well, I got so much more name recognition than any of the other candidates. So essentially, that's the one guy I really got to kind of, um, you know, slay right now and get him out of the race. And then, you know, and then whoever got, whoever pops up after that, it's like the game whack-a-mole. You know, Ron DeSantis goes down, Nikki Haley comes up. Nikki Haley goes down, Asa Hodgson comes up. But 
as soon as somebody gets up to five, six, seven percent of the polls, all of a sudden Donald Trump upbraids them. Yep. So can any other candidate stand up to Donald Trump in a debate? Because <clears throat> Donald Trump doesn't worry about convention or any sort of pretension of uh, decency. Yeah, he's unconventional. And uh, can anybody, like, can Nikki Haley do what Hillary Clinton did not? Can they play that game? Can DeSantis play that game? Can stand up to him and slap him down somehow? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, DeSant I think that DeSantis has to make sure he doesn't become what Mar what he called Marco Rubio, the other guy from Florida that ran against him in 2016 when Trump would say "Little Marco," because DeSantis is relatively short. So maybe he would say so instead of Ron Sanctimonious, if that doesn't start to work, he might start calling him Little Ron. <laughs> but um, I don't but see no, why I Ron think I don't think Ron Sanctimonious. I don't. I don't. Are those effective? Like I wouldn't be deterred if I was like liking DeSantis, but because he called him Ron Sanctimonious. Most <laughs> half the people don't know what Sanctimonious is. <laughs> I don't think it's the best nickname. I think when he called Ted Cruz Lion Ted, that's that more worked, like it, right? Because <laughs> it was so simple. It was so simple. Right. When he said Jeb Bush is low energy Jeb. That was simple. Little Marco. Marco Rubio was little Marco. That was that was simpler. That was simple. Um, Ron DeSantimonious, I don't think was a bad. I mean, I'm wondering if they poll tested it. I don't know. No yeah, way. They called him that before the actual midterm elections, too. Uh, yeah. And nobody's really come up with an effective or even tried that I've heard or remember to do the same to Donald Trump. Well, they, the closest they, was Marco Rubio. What did he have? Well, so Donald, so he Donald, he would talk about to so Donald Trump, call him Little Marco, and then Marco Rubio kind of made fun of him and says, "Well, Donald Trump has Donald Trump has big hands," and he was in Virginia. He kind of made that, and he was trying to, but he would, it just couldn't, it just did not work for him. No, that was Marco that was Rubio's lame. general strategy. So it kind of actually landed up backfiring, and Marco Rubio eventually landed up losing the nomination, losing his home state of Florida too. By the way, I think uh, something of something related to golf and accusations of golf taking liberties with golf l rules like golf cheater golf cheater trump that doesn't really work but something like that <laughs> that might <laughs> i don't know i don't i think when you play trump's game it usually backfires because he's better at it yeah oh he's better at it you got to get a good name and you got to believe it you got to say it you got to stick with it you got to practice it in the mirror and, and be good I, it's just a it takes Trump's been doing that all his life and people are new at it and they try it and they're not as good. He has a knack for it. Yeah. He has a congenital um, really brilliance at it, but I can't think of anyone who's actually gone to him, gone with him toe to toe and really actually won on that. I mean, Hillary Clinton certainly tried it. Hillary Clinton could not do it. She, he was always, he was always calling her, you know, crooked Hillary. I think that when he called Joe Biden, sleepy Joe, I don't think that had quite as much effect. No, what was, no, what was right. It's not a crime to be sleepy. Well, I think actually in this time, it actually could have backfired in that respect that people may say, well, we want somebody who's not going to be quite as um, polarizing, not going to be a lightning rod, not going to be a polemicist. So they might say, we actually want that. It's kind of like, it's interesting. Back in 2012, when Barack Obama was running against Mitt Romney, David Axelrod and some of the coefficients of the Obama administration met with Bill Clinton. And they were talking about, Bill. they were saying, we need to go after Mitt Romney because he flip-flopped so many times in his political career. Bill Clinton's advice was, no, don't do that. Go after him as an extremist Republican. Because if you go after him as a flip-flopper, the voters are essentially going to say, well, he said he was severely conservative. He ran to the right during the primary. But look at his first two years as governor. Look when he ran for Senate. He's really not a conservative. And they'll say, well, you know, he's just saying this to get elected. It's better to go after somebody directly and say that they were an extremist. If you say, if, he, if it, going after them as an extremist who actually believes what he says versus somebody who's just saying it to, who's just saying it to win the Republican nomination, people are, people are more likely to support a, uh, to support a moderate who's essentially mm -hmm. lying about who he is than to support a, than, th than to support somebody who's way out there, who's going to cut social security, cut Medicare, which is what they tried to portray and successfully portray Mitt Romney that year as. I have one for DeSantis or or even Haley that they can use in the primaries, and that's and it, I would it'd make Trump crazy. And it's simple: it's loser Donald or loser Trump. That Lo would, if I, you keep keep branding him with loser, 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 that, that would be a problem in a primary. 
that would absolutely run. And then in the case of Trump, though, he'd say, well, the only decision, the only time I was a loser was when I um, nominated you to become UN, UN ambassador <laughs> and say you failed me or something like that. Yeah, but somehow the, after you say loser Trump, horses out of the barn, the, the gun's hey. gone off and any reply is kind of weak. Loser I, Trump, loser Trump, loser Trump. And he, he, he would really it would make him crazy. If, if, well, if, the, if the Santa said that to him, he'd say, yeah, and I picked you as a loser when you were running for the Republican nomination. Adam Putnam was going to become governor, of, was going to win the nomination or governor of Florida. Then I picked this loser. I should have picked Putnam. He said, you're the real loser. And then, yeah. and then to which DeSantis but has- that's a bunch response. of words. That's just a bunch of words that, that don't have the impact of the phrase over and over. Loser Trump, loser Donald, or cheater. And then DeSantis would have the perfect response, though. He'd say, well, you know- in 2020, you, he says two times you've lost a popular vote. He said, I just won the biggest midterm election of any Republican in the history of Florida, the biggest um, re-election, and the largest, by the largest margin of any governor since Bob Graham in 1982. And then Donald Trump doesn't have a response to that. There you go. That's why you should be working for these campaigns. I could help with the slogans if you can do all the rest. Yes. So anything, let's do one more and uh, call it a day. Call it a day. Okay. Oh, uh, do do one more phrase saying. One more phrase. Let's see. What's <laughs> one that's what's one that's what's one that's really good? Uh that's really effective. There was the um there was triangulation. Here's one. Triangulation. This was remember Dick Morris. Dick Morris was the advisor to Bill Clinton. Actually yeah. advised him mm -hmm. in his political career, going back to his days in Arkansas. He was actually recommended to him by David Pryor, who was Clinton's predecessor as governor of Arkansas. And here's something interestingly. In 1978, Bill Clinton was running for was running for governor, and David Pryor was running for Senate. And David Pryor was running against a guy named Jim Guy Tucker. And Bill Clinton thought that Jim Guy Tucker was going to be his main opponent in his political career, and he was right. So Bill Clinton and Dick Morris were essentially running political ads for David Pryor against Jim Guy Tucker to try to get Tucker so he'd lose the Senate race. So Clinton was secretly doing this. And one of the ads, they'd show a member of, they show numbers, all the four members of the Arkansas congressional delegation. They'd say, you know, they'd say, Mr. Thornton, I, I, Mr. Hammersmith, no. And they'd say, Mr. Tucker, Mr. Tucker, Mr. Tucker, meaning that Tucker was spending all his time campaigning and not being a congressman. And it worked. Um, so, and Clinton was right. Bill Clinton runs for governor of Arkansas, 1978 wins, 1980 loses, becomes the second, the, the youngest ex-governor in history, 1982. Once again, his opponent, his opponent is actually Jim Guy Tucker. And Clinton lands up defeating him in the in the in the in the primary, then wins the runoff and goes on to win the election. 1990, um, Bill Clinton's thinking of running for president. Tucker actually declares he's going to run for governor, and then decides he's not. When Clinton declares, and then he runs lieutenant governor and becomes president. And later, Dick Morris um, actually Dick Dick Morris tells Clinton that Tucker had found out that Clinton had done this, and they actually sent an emissary to Arkansas to ask Tucker if it was okay, and basically said, "Yeah, I'm over it." But at any rate. Dick Morris comes back in 1995 to try to rescue Bill Clinton after he loses 53 seats in the House of Representatives and six seats in the Senate. And he comes up with this idea of triangulation, which is essentially you take the best of both, you co-opt the best of both liberalism and conservatism, and you create your own ideology the third way. So it's like a triangle right here. So essentially you take from Democrats the idea that you need to be sympathetic to the poor, that you don't want to go after Work or working mothers, you don't have to go out to widowed mothers, you don't want to have to go after the homeless, and you take from the Republicans the idea of personal responsibility. So your welfare reform proposal, for example, Bill Clinton's welfare reform is essentially part liberal in terms of there's a welfare to work, we're going to try to help you get a job. On the other side, it says that there's going to be limits. So he vetoes the first two pieces of legislation that Republicans send him, then he works a kind of compromise, and the third piece of legislation the Republicans send him he essentially signs. So he basically makes it a sympathetic view of welfare reform. So that's one example of essentially what he does in terms of triangulation. He's trying to run against basically both parties. So he's got yep. the Democrats here, the liberals here, conservatives here, and then there's Clintonism. And Clintonism won in 1996. So would that work now? I mean, a way you could triangulate now is, is be someone who says, I get it that there's a problem on the border. We need strict right. immigration policy. I get that. And you could say, yeah, I get that wokeism is overboard. But yes. then you could also adopt, you could say, you know, we do need some gun control. 
there, that, that's an aperture right there. There is absolutely a movement for that. And actually, when it comes to gun control, that was actually part of triangulation. When it comes to crime, for example, Bill Clinton on the one side says, yes, I support the Brady Bill. I support the ban on semi-automatic weapons. But he says we also need, and this is when he ran in 92 too, but he said we also need 100,000 more police officers on the street. So he brings the liberalism of gun control and the conservatism of law and order and brings them together kind of for his own kind of different ideology. Our this trade, on the one side, you say, well, the Republicans want free trade and think they want open markets. I support that. Democrats think that there should be agreements, side agreements on labor, on environmental. I support that as well. So this is kind of my third way. As a result, in 1996, Bill Clinton was seen as somebody who was kind of above the traditional two-party system. So as a result, by the way, many de some Democrats, Jesse Jackson, for example, were thinking about actually running against him in the primary, eventually didn't. But there were some Democrats who were saying, well, he's not really a Democrat anymore. But this landed up the point of the fact of the matter is from a pure winning standpoint, if you're a cold calculated standpoint, Bill Clinton won re-election in part by taking different, the, the most popular aspects of both parties and essentially um, and essentially dis, and essentially dissipating the more unpopular parts of both parties, the kind of extremes, if you will. Is there any potential presidential candidate this time that would be most likely to triangulate in the manner that I suggested? Yeah, I think a couple. I think Larry Hogan, the governor, of, former governor now of Maryland, is one who I think will absolutely do this. I think he's going to basically say, on the one hand, He's going to say, yes, we support the idea of less government. And I definitely believe that um, he's going to say, I believe that Joe Biden has basically gone too far. On the other side, he's going to say that our party has become too extreme, that we need to listen to others um, and that we don't. And, the, and that when it comes to the border, just like you're talking about, on the one hand, yes, we need comprehensive immigration reform. We absolutely need to curtail illegal immigrants, but we also need to be very sympathetic in terms of asylum something to that effect and kind of bring the two sides together for his own ideology. Asa Hutchinson, the former governor of Arkansas, might try something like that. Chris Christie, the former governor of New Jersey, um, I think that might try something. I think Bill Hurd, the Congress, former congressman from Texas. Those are the Republicans, I think, that are really going to try a message like that. And interestingly, the last candidate after Bill Clinton, I think, who actually did that and succeeded was probably George W. Bush. George W. Bush, when he ran in 2000, talked about compassionate conservatism. Yeah. Okay. And he talked about how he said the party is not slouching toward Gomorrah, which is what former um, solicitor general, former, um, I guess, former um, very short period of time, Attorney General Robert Bork had wrote a book called Slouching Toward Gomorrah. And George W. Bush basically said, we don't need to balance the budget on the backs of poor people. So this was his essential platform. He talked about faith based initiatives. And as a result, he basically tied an election where you have an incumbent president with a job approval of 66 percent. Under any possible other circumstances, he should have lost that election by about 10 points. And he also said we should essentially we can continue the Clinton prosperity, but we can also have a tax cut. So he's essentially he's, like, he's bringing these two sides together. But he was the last candidate, I really think, one on triangulation. But I think Bill Clinton and George W. Bush were basically triangulators at, at heart. OK, cool. So this has been excellent. Can you I forgot last time to have you mention your books, particularly your great American trivia book. I hope you have it right there. Oh, yes. These books, folks, are available, and they're a great deal, and they're super fun. If you've lasted all this this way with us uh, geeking out on politics, then this book is totally for you. What's the actual name of it? The Great American Political Trivia Challenge, Political Trivia on Steroids. Yay. And that's, look up Rich Rubino when you're searching for that. Rich, thank you. It's a great way to spend a uh, late Friday morning, each Friday, as it turns out. There's no rule that it has to be Friday, but it just happens. It seems to work out that way. So thank you very much, Rich. And uh, listeners, if you if you dug this, tell your friends and, and share it. And both uh, Rich and I will share it. And uh, we'll see you soon, Rich. Thanks. Yes, and happy birthday, William Henry Harrison. Oh, yes, of course. That's right. I have to make